for this meetup. Uh, my name is Prashant Bhattacharya. I am a scientist uh, at the Institute of High Performance Computing, where I work with this social and cognitive computing group. Um, so very broadly, my, my work focuses on mining insights from social data uh, across different kinds of platforms. So thank you, PyData uh, Singapore, for giving this opportunity to share some of my work with you. And, and hopefully, uh, in, um, this is probably going to be a very insightful uh, next hour or so. So I, I pretty much have three broad goals you know, for, for myself for the next, next hour. Uh, feel free to, to suggest any, any changes. But I want, to, I want to introduce some basic concepts in social network for those of you who are interested in getting into the field. Um, I know some of you would have some prior experience working with social networks in, in your own applications, in your own areas. But I'm just going to give some very basic foundational knowledge to help um, those of you who come from relatively newer backgrounds. Uh, I'm going to talk about some social network applications, particularly the ones that are of interest to me. Uh, so this is by no means a representative list of social network uh, questions or problems that people are working on in the data science community. But this is just a, a very convenient subset of problems that I've been working on. And finally, I, I really hope to learn from you. I'm, I'm very interested, and we'll probably talk about this offline. Uh, but I'm really interested to know why you think social networks could be of some importance to the work that you do in, in your sphere of work. All right. So a question that I often get in, in, in conferences and seminars, and frankly, whoever I you know, talk to uh, when I say that I work on social networks, a lot of people feel that, well, yes, you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but why do I need to care about social networks? And generally, I, I have this one slide that I show everyone, and I've been showing this more and more of late. And I think if I have to just end this presentation after one slide, it would be this, uh, this next slide. Um, and so this is, again, I mean, this is very, very exciting for, for Game of Thrones fans. If you, if you watch the show, uh, you'd probably find this of some interest. And this is actually a network of who betrays whom over the past six seasons of Game of Thrones. And if, you know, if you've been following the series, you know the betrayals are, are an integral part of this particular TV show. And you have these different houses. And people, people betray each other to different degrees. So the thicker the line, the stronger the effect of the betrayal. And if you, have, if you see any dashed lines, it probably means that it's, it's implied but not proven. There's probably betrayal but not sure. Um, and if you, you can read the whole blog, you can just Google Game of Thrones betrayals and you get a nice social network. It's a GIF file that, that has nice animation. But I was thinking, when I was looking at this, I was thinking that you could even go a step further and do network analysis on this graph to come up with models that can actually predict where the next betrayal is going to come from. You know, who's going to betray, who's going to kill whom in the next episode of Game of Thrones? Uh, people have actually tried to do that uh, unsuccessfully, if I might add. Uh, but this is, again, a great example of what you can do uh, with social networks just in terms of you know, uh, being, being goofy. But again, social networks is not new. I mean, this is not a you know, George Martin uh, creation. It's, people have been doing social networks for a fairly long time. Uh, I would say that it really started back in the day in the 18th century uh, with Leonhard Euler and the famous Konigsberg Seven Bridges problem. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this problem. This, this is considered to be the first theorem in graph theory. Uh, and the idea was that Euler used to live in this, in, in this place uh, called Konigsberg. And he, and he had always had this idea in his head that can I start from a point and, tra and traverse the whole mainland and the islands uh, through these seven bridges and come back to my original point without having traversed any one bridge twice. Right? So that's the problem. And he thought about this, and he came up with a theorem basically saying that, no, it's not possible. And it's only possible to do that under a certain set of conditions, which he laid down. Um, and, and, and today, I mean, when we study graph theory, we, we talk about Eulerian cycles and planar graphs. And we know that under certain conditions, you could probably satisfy these conditions. Uh, so this is probably a, an early example of when people started thinking about graph theory and social networks. But when it comes to actual data, because this is a data science community, I know you're interested about data. 
uh, we actually had to wait a century to the early 19th century. And the data didn't come from humans, interestingly. Uh, it came from bees. And there was another Swiss naturalist called Pierre Huber in 1802 who actually studied bees uh, for a living. And he wrote a big dissertation on different kinds of behavior among bumblebees, one of which was this idea of dominance patterns. Because you know, bees have very complex societies. You have very layered structures. You know, certain kinds of bees do work. Certain kinds of bees are involved in reproduction. Then you have a queen bee. And, and Hooper was trying to study dominant structures among these different classes of bees. And that, I arg arguably, is probably the first time um, someone did a systematic study of social networks using actual obser observational data. All right. So this is not new. So I'm not, I'm not the first person to talk about this. Now, networks exist everywhere. You don't have to go back to uh, the 18th century to talk about networks. Uh, if, you have, if you have taken the MRT to come to this, uh, to this session, you've already traversed a network. And I, I keep making this point. Whenever I see people browsing Facebook on, on the MRT, I think to myself that here's a person who is browsing an online social network while traversing an offline social network. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize this. So MRTs are a great example of social networks. And even if you don't realize this, you'd, you'd, you're actually experiencing network effects every single day uh, as, you, as you take these MRTs. So here's a very nice infographic from Channel News Asia that I picked up. And it talks about MRT delays. Now, no, so MRT delays are becoming a reality of life in Singapore. And this graph shows you which lines are more prone to MRT delays. So what this actually tells you is how many kilometers does the train go before it, 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 faults, uh, it, it shows a fault again. All right? And you see the, the green line is particularly bad. So it sort of breaks down pretty often. And, and the blue line, since it's probably because it's a newer line, it, it's much better. But the, re, but the problem starts um, when delays in one line start spilling over into the other, right? Because the MRT is a networked system. If you have delays or breakdowns in one line, it pushes people onto another line, and then it causes situations like this, right? And so even though you might not be interested in studying networks, uh, you are the un you're sort of the annoying uh, victims of network effects in your daily life. And it, it's worth remembering it. Uh, what's also interesting, and what's something put, that I find particularly uh, intriguing in social networks, is that social networks are universal. Um, I would I argue that there are very few areas of science that are as cross-cutting as social networks. So you could be doing very different things, but encountering very similar network patterns in your data. And let me give you an example of just how extreme it could be. Um, so let me give you a bit of a context behind what I'm going to show you next. So there was a team uh, of researchers at uh, Sapporo University in Japan working with a team of researchers uh, at Oxford in the UK. And they were trying to study how slime molds, all right, these are unicellular organisms. They have no brain, single cell. How slime mold form food networks. So slime molds are, are, are um, well known for forming really good and efficient networks for supplying food particles uh, within their cells. And the, the interesting thing about slime molds is that even though they're unicellular, you can actually see a slime mold with naked eye if it grows big enough. All right. So what they did was the researchers sprinkled, uh, I think it was oat flakes. Uh, apparently, oat flakes are a slime mold favorite. Um, so they sprinkled oat flakes uh, on, a, on a Petri dish and they try to culture a slime mold. So they let a slime mold grow. And what you see on the screen uh, in, in, in column, column wise is the network of the slime mold as it spreads and tries to connect food centers, you know, wherever it finds food, uh, forming these food tunnels to transport food particles within its cell. And, you, and the photos you see are from 0 hours, 5 hour, 8 hour, 11 hours, 16 hours, and 26 hours from the point starting of the experiment. So at the end of 26 hours, you see this very intricate 
uh, but very clear network of food supplies that the slime mold forms. So this is within a day. Now what I did not tell you while explaining this experiment is the positions where the oat flakes were placed by the researchers. Now these were researchers in Japan uh, who were intelligent enough to coincide the position of the oat flakes with cities around Tokyo. Um, so the, the big spot in the middle was the Tokyo uh, city and all the other dots were cities around Tokyo. And what they found after 26 hours was that this mold network, the network formed by the slime mold, resembled the actual Tokyo train network which engineers in Japan had taken decades to build to a surprising degree. And this was astonishing. This was published in Science, I think back in 2010. Uh, how a single-celled organism using very simple heuristics can mimic what took engineers in arguably one of the most developed countries in the world decades to do uh, is still mystery. But this really shows the beauty of network evolution and how networks could show striking similarity across very different contexts. All right, here's another of my favorites. So there's this website called Movie Galaxies. Uh, check it out. Um, and what this website does is it tries to show networks of movie characters or different kinds of movies. So you can enter your own movie and, and essentially see how the characters interact with each other. So if there's a tie between any two characters, it means that the characters have interacted at least once. And the thicker the line, the stronger the communication. All right? And why is this important? Because if you just visualize, so I mean, no prizes for guessing, but this is from Lord of, Lord of the Rings. All right. Um, any idea which one? Any guesses? Yeah, the first one. Yeah, all right. Uh, and so you could probably see that this is a multi-character movie. There's no one uh, important protagonist. But there are many important dots in, the, in this one. A very similar structure for this other one. Any guesses which, what movie this one is? The Godfather, the Godfather. yeah. And so you see um, there is uh, clearly uh, Michael, who's the, the protagonist. Uh, but there are also these other characters who are also equally important. But there could be egocentric movies. So again, I'm, even if you have no idea about the movie cast and characters and the plot, you could look at this network and you could probably see that this is an egocentric movie. It, it revolves around one character. And, and this is, of course, Schindler's List. Um, this is for Forrest Gump. Again, a very egocentric movie. And even if you, if you, if you have not seen the movie, uh, which you must, uh, you should see the movie. But uh, this, again, is a very egocentric network. And just by looking at the network, you could probably have some inference about what's going on in, in the movie. And again, this is somewhere in the middle. So you could have movies with two strong characters. All right, So this is Bourne Identity. Uh, so you have uh, Jason Bourne on one side and Alexander um, Conklin on the other side. Uh, this was, again, uh, the main, uh, the protagonist and the antagonist in the same movie. And this is from Titanic, which, of course, had two characters, both of whom died. Uh, but then again, it's a duocentric movie with two very important characters. Uh, just some fun examples of what you can do with networks, even if you have no idea about the context. All right, so now that you've I hope I've sufficiently uh, motivated you in why it's worth your time. Uh, let me give you some really boring details about uh, how do you work with network data. All right. So this is network 101. Um, so any complex system would probably have several components. So you can think of uh, each dot on the screen as a node. Uh, a node could be uh, a person, a node could be a, a product, an object, uh, anything. And I mean, a society uh, is, is comprised of multiple individuals. So if you think of society as the whole graph, uh, one node would be an individual. Uh, and again, if you're on the bottom left of the screen, I've actually added some code snippet. This is from uh, the Network X library in Python. Uh, not my favorite library, but very easy to use. And this is probably easy enough if you're working with small graphs. 
But for larger graphs, it's probably better to use a, a library like iGraph, for example, or graph tools. Uh, but network S is pretty handy. And you can see it's, it's very easy to construct graphs. Uh, it's a matter of a few lines. So once you have the nodes, you could also have edges, which are really relationships. And the relationships could be friendship, kinship, co-authors, romantic relationships, etc. So it could be any kind of relationship between the nodes. So the one benefit of really forming this relationship is you could then ask questions about prediction. So in this case, you could probably ask, who will Alice befriend next? So given that this is the current structure, who's Alice going to befriend next? In terms of Game of Thrones, you could ask, who's Cersei going to kill next? Right? So you have similar questions about prediction. You could also uh, have a question sir, about explanation. So why did Alice befriend Bob? This is more retrospective. If I give you the data about the network and the behavior, can you uncover uh, reasonable explanations for why something happened? So this is the explanatory part. So again, a quick sort of mental uh, floss for, for all of you. So if Alice starts to smoke, again, an observable behavior, what is the likelihood that Bob will start smoking too? All right. So this is an open question. You have to think about it. So you could also think about why should there be a correlation to begin with? Okay. And if there is a significant correlation, how can we be sure that it's because of the network type? It could be about for very various other reasons, right? And uh, finally, I mean, more kind of a, a practical implication would be that if we do find evidence of some kind of network effect, can we then exploit or leverage this knowledge to design some kind of intervention to cure someone of, of a particular disorder or a particular addiction? All right. So that's, again, uh, these are sample questions that you could probably think about when, when thinking about networks. OK, back to network properties. So as I said, you could have actors, and then actors have relations. Now, these actors and these relations have of different types. So a very simple network could be an undirected and binary network. So undirected because the edges don't have arrows. So these relationships have no direction. Uh, so you can think about friendship in the real world. Probably do doesn't have any, any direction. But on Facebook, it does have direction, right? So you know who sends a friend request. So you can have a directed arrow from one person to the other. Um, you now it could be a directed and binary. So again, the Facebook French friend networks would probably fit into this one. Now the, the edges themselves could, not be, could also be weighted and not binary. So instead of having 0 or 1, it could also have some kind of weight. Uh, think about your communication network on your phone. So if you call someone once a day versus five times a day, this can be the weight on the communication networks. And again, weights tend to be very, very important in a lot of predictive uh, models. And finally, it could be directed values. So it's a two by two kind of an option, right? So you can be uh, binary or weighted, directed or undirected. Now, how do you store network data in terms of data structures? The simplest way of storing network data is through what's called an adjacency matrix. So where you have nodes on two axes, and if there is an edge, you place one. If there is no edge, you enter zero or leave it blank. And this is for, again, a binary adjacency matrix. So for directed, as you can see, it's not symmetric. So A to B is not the same as B to A. Uh, so this is probably the most common way of storing adjacency matrices. But there is a, a big problem in this form of data structure. Any guesses? What's that? Yes. So it doesn't scale. So when you have a really large network, this creates a, a, a big storage problem because you're essentially using a lot of memory for storing very little information about the network, which is why you could probably store it as sparse matrices, et cetera, in Python or R. Uh, this is possibly a, a slight improvement over adjacency matrices. So you can convert any matrix to a list. So this is a much more optimized way of storing network data. 
because you're only storing the edges, right? And finally, this is possibly the most common form of network data, uh, edge list, where one row essentially has one pair of nodes. Um, and you could have optional columns for the weights. So each row could have a weight, and uh, multiple weights, actually, depending on how many kinds of relationships you're trying to model. So uh, there are also node level features. So again, I use the term attribute synonymously with feature in terms of a machine learning context. So you could think of centrality. So it's very simply put, centrality talks about importance of a node in a network. So degree centrality essentially is the number of connections that connects uh, a particular node. Then you, have, you could have an out degree and you can have an in degree. So an out degree are the number of nodes that flow outwards from a particular, uh, uh, a number of edges that flow outwards from a particular node. In degrees would be the number of edges that are incident on a particular node, all right? So in terms of uh, adjacency matrix, so if you have to consider the out degree of C, it would be a row sum, right? Uh, An in degree of C would be a call sum, right? A sum of columns. Uh, you could have slightly uh, more sophisticated centrality measures. So closeness is a very interesting measure that essentially gives you the distance of a node from every other node in the network. So you can think of um, starting from one MRT uh, in your MR Singapore MRT network and trying to find out what's the shortest distance by which I can reach a particular, some other MRT station in a different uh, line. And all of you navigate this question every day. So what you're doing in your head is essentially computing the centrality, the closeness centrality measure. Um, so it's, in terms of mathematical formulation, it's essentially the inverse of the farness. So D of, uh, D of i and j is the shortest path between i and j. Uh, and you take the inverse of that, uh, you get a closeness. Uh, betweenness is probably the most computationally intensive metric to compute. So betweenness gives you a measure of how many shortest paths of the graph pass through the focal node. So if you want to find the betweenness of a particular node i, it means how many shortest paths in your network pass through i. So if, if, you, if you think about how you would compute this, you'd very soon realize that this is a computational nightmare, uh, especially for really large networks. And so there are, there are approximations to make this faster. And it also helps if you have uh, parallelized versions of whatever functions you're using to compute this. Uh, finally, and this is probably my least favorite uh, centrality measure called eigenvector centrality. And the reason I don't particularly like it is because it's reflective in nature. So what eigenvector centrality means is that the centrality of a particular node is a function of the centrality of all, all its surrounding nodes. So if you have really important friends, eigenvector centrality treats your importance as very high. Now, this has an inherent problem. And can someone guess what this problem might be? Now think of it in, in your own social life. If your importance is measured by how many important people you know, why might this not be a very clever way of computing importance? All right, so I'll give you the answer. It's because going forward, this is a reflective process. So if in first, if in first month, your importance is a function of all your friends' importance, and you have really important friends, then even if you're not important, you, you get a very high score. Then in the second time period, since you're very important, it feeds back to all, all your friends, right? Because all your friends' importance increases as a process of reflection. And this goes back and forth, and over time, you'd get a network where few nodes have very high importance, and, few no and some other nodes have very little. So it, it sort of clusters these, um, the importance in very small portions of the network. Now, what this network shows you is that you could have a network with different nodes having different levels of centrality. So in this network, you have different nodes which have higher degree or higher betweenness or higher closeness. So there's no one um, size fits all explanation for centrality. 
depending on what you're looking for, different nodes in a network could be considered to be central or not central. All right? So this is very important to keep in mind when you're working with real applications. All right. Um, so before I get into some open applications that I'm currently working on, yeah, is, there some, is there a question that, I, that you'd, you're probably thinking about or, or something that you'd probably uh, want answered at, at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned about the eigen centrality, <coughs> but isn't that uh, close to what Google uses for page, page rank. algorithms? Yeah. So are you saying that because of the Google search of page rank, this problem is already happening the importance of websites and not important websites? Uh, well, so, so, page, so page rank and then there are other kinds of centrality like cache centrality. There are improvements of eigenvector centrality that they try to uh, rectify for the reflection problem. Uh, but it uses a similar principle. But since they try to rectify for the reflection problem through approximations, it's, it's less acute as with eigenvector centrality. Uh, I don't think there are any real-world applications today that, that actively use eigenvector centrality. Page rank is much safer. Yeah. All right, yeah? yeah. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last one? The, the repulsion strength? Yeah. So it, if I have to summarize your question, you want to know if in, in, in current contemporary social network research, do they take into account different types of centrality measures in conjunction to come up with a more accurate measure of centrality? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. I mean, so no one knows for sure what algorithm uh, LinkedIn uses for uh, computing its influencers. Um, but again, as I mentioned, different members in the network could be central for very different applications. So having a one kind of size fits all approach to identifying central members in a network uh, can be fatal. So if you're, if you're thinking about influencers, so you have to ask yourself the question, am I looking at influencers in terms of job seeking? Am I looking at influencers in terms of uh, rec recommending new friends? Uh, in these two applications, you could have very different uh, applications of closeness centrality. So I would say, for example, closeness centrality, the way I just explained, would be particularly useful in terms of recommending new friends. But if I'm looking at influencers in terms of someone who can um, provide me with high quality content on a particular topic, I would probably go for someone with high betweenness, because this is a person who, has, who, who sort of joins multiple clusters of information so he or she is likely to have access to richer information than someone with high closeness. So again, yeah, I totally agree that uh, you would have to take a factor in these different kinds of closeness uh, centrality measures in coming up with the conclusion. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Go ahead. How 
Well, uh, one way to overcome this problem is, of course, to discount. So if you have to break the reflection process. So if, if you influence your friends, and your friends influence you, and this goes back and forth, you have to have some parameter or, or some way of kind of probabilistically breaking the cycle such that you influence your friends, but then only a subset of them can influence you with a certain probability. This is a very naive way of doing it. Um, but if you do that, then it sort of breaks the cycle of reflection. And it gives you a, a much better approximation of the centrality measure. Yeah, You could also normalize by the number of friends that you have. So this problem would be particularly acute if you have a lot of friends. So if you normalize by the number of friends you have, you sort of reduce the intensity of the problem. Yeah. All right. Yeah, go on. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you, could you, could you rephrase the question? Who's the most probable what? Uh, terrorist. Terrorist. <laughs> no. Uh, but that, I mean, other people have done that uh, to, to, to actually, uh, with, with observational data. The problem with terrorist networks is you don't have data like ground truth data. Because if you had ground truth, you would probably be able to stop the attack in the first place. But uh, there are research groups that work on uh, constructed net terrorist network data from like newspaper reports and articles. And they have been able to like, retrospecti ret retrospectively predict uh, certain kinds of attacks in certain places. So yeah, there, there is definitely a use case for using network. It's just that the network data for terrorists is so hard to come by. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike Game of Thrones. Yeah. All right. so, uh, so let me talk very briefly about some open problems and open research uh, uh, areas that, I, that I'm working on. Um, and it's, it's going to be very hard to follow the, the terrorist network question. So nothing as interesting as, as plotting terrorist networks. Um, but before we get into that, so I want to talk about there are some unique research problems that you would face if you're trying to study social networks or in, 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 you know, in a research setting or in, 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 a, in, in industry and in applications. So there are basically two broad areas of work with social networks. First is about structure uh, and evolution. So understanding how certain kinds of networks evolve over time. Uh, the other is about processes. This is about me uh, mechanisms. So you can think about uh, smoking as a behavior and ask the question, how does smoking as a behavior spread in a network? So this is about processes. But the big problem is that structure and processes are both what's called confounded. And by this, uh, what I mean is that you cannot study one without controlling for the other. So think about it. If your friends influence your behavior, you have to ask yourself the question, why am I friends with this person to begin with? Right? So uh, there have been studies in the past where uh, they showed uh, that smoking can be contagious. So if you have a friend who's, who's a, a chain smoker, it's a very high chance that you'd start smoking too. But then there are crit the critics of this approach uh, would tell you that maybe you met the person at the smoking pit. And that's how you guys became friends. And so if you ignore the network formation process, you might end up with very different conclusions about what's happening. Uh, the big problem in this area is that it's very hard to do experiments. So as you would know, uh, an industry and research gold standard in, in understanding these things is, is doing experiments, doing A-B tests, right? But the big problem with networks is doing randomized control trials, or, or what, what's popularly known as A-B tests, is very, very tricky. And I want to talk about it uh, in, in the next few slides. Uh, which brings me to my favorite research area, which is peer influence. Uh, so I like to study influence processes in different areas. So how do people influence each other for a variety of behaviors? So again, a little bit of math, just to give you the impression that it's something important. Uh, for person I, if you intervene on some behavior, uh, you would probably observe 
a change in outcome, right? This is a very simple explanation of, of this one line. What I'm interested in is what happens if I intervene on the person's friends? How does that change the focal person's behavior? So if I have to uh, say, let's think about your best friend, and I intervene on some behavior of your best friend. So maybe I, I try to imprison him, and I try to see the change in your behavior. So that's peer influence. Um, peer influence processes are everywhere. This is not, this is not something new. Um, peer influence has been studied in adoption of brands or products. So if you uh, buy a new iPhone, how soon does your best friend buy an iPhone? That's peer influence. You can think about diffusion of innovations. So there are villages in, in Southeast Asia where governments are trying to introduce microfinance programs. And they essentially rely on peer influence processes to diffuse these innovations uh, in the communities. Spread of disorders. So there are some studies that actually talk about how certain kinds of diseases are, are, are for example, are, are disorders, like eating disorders, can be contagious. And there have been cr uh, criticisms of those studies as well. And finally, voting behavior. And there are a lot of studies, uh, for obvious reasons, that look at how, uh, how uh, the pattern in which your friends uh, uh, vote leaders can influence your own voting patterns. And there's a very famous study for Facebook uh, which showed that on the election day, by showing notifications of how many of your friends are going to vote, can significantly change the chances of, of you going and, and casting your own vote. So by using these social cues, they can actually increase voting turnouts. And finally, content consumption. So this is very common, right? So you, you, whatever you post or consume on social media is very directly influenced by your friends. All right, but the big problem in, in studying peer influence is that it's always mixed up with what's called homophily. Uh, homophily, again, very simply put, means birds of, of the same feather flock together. So if you're similar in certain respects, you'd probably hang together. And this is a problem when trying to study influence. So over the years, like over centuries, people have observed that when you are in a particular pair, so if you are in a relationship with someone, be it any kind of relationship, there's a high chance that the two of you would show very similar behaviors. But the question is, is it only because of influence? All right. So let me tell you a hypothetical story to argue against this. And this is from one of my least favorite research papers uh, by Shalizian Thomas. And it's not my least favorite research paper because it's a bad paper. It's actually a fantastic paper. It's my least favorite research paper because this probably delayed my graduation by a year. Um, so suppose you have a, a situation where there are two friends named Ian and Joey. And Ian's parents ask him, hey, if your friend Joey jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? And the question the authors ask is why might Ian answer yes? So a simple answer would be, Joey's example inspired Ian. And this is influence, right? This is what all of you would normally think, that my best friend influenced me to jump off the bridge. But there could be at least five other explanations for what just happened. So this is another case. Maybe Joey infected Ian with a parasite which suppresses fear of falling. So this is what's called biological contagion. It's like he injected Ian with, a, with, with, with this particular virus that somehow messed with his mind. Uh, the other option could be that Joey and Ian are friends on account of their shared fondness for jumping off bridges. And this is really homophily on the focal behavior. So both of them, for some weird reason, like jumping off bridges. And it's just so happened that they jumped off the bridge at the same time. All right, here's another one. Joey and Ian became friends through a thrill-seeking club whose membership you can freely see. So this is also observed homophily, but on a different kind of behavior. So they joined this club, and this club have weekly meetups. 
only that the meetup like topics are, are very weird. So maybe on that particular week, the, the agenda was to jump off bridges. And so this is homophily, but based on a different behavior. It could also be a case of unobserved homophily, which we don't observe. A good example of this is maybe both of them have an inner desire for thrill seeking, which none of us know about, and their parents didn't know about. And this inner desire drove them to jump off the bridge. And the last one, maybe both of them realized that the bridge is about to collapse, and jumping off the bridge might be a safer option. So this has nothing to do with influence or homophily. It's just a situational factor that drove both of them to a similar activity. So there are at least six reasons why certain behaviors could be correlated. All right, so how can you disentangle influence from these other five factors? Uh, this was sort of something that I tried to address in my uh, PhD, which is probably why it took a lot of time. Um, so proving existence of homophilic influence is not easy. Quantifying homophilic influence is probably possible from data in certain specific contexts. Again, not true in the general case. But isolating the effect of one from the other is extremely hard. And this is probably the central problem in social networks research. So if, if you're interested in reading the paper, uh, you, can, you can probably take a look. But this is not just a research problem. For those of you who might be wondering if it's just an academic problem, not really. Because uncovering influence is actually key to making the right managerial decisions. So for example, if you are Apple and you're launching a new product, a new iPhone, and you're interested to know how this is going to diffuse through the network, you should have a good idea of how diffusion works. And diffusion is basically influence. Now, quantifying homophily is also equally important. If you're Facebook building a new friendship recommendation engine, uh, it's in your best interest to understand how people form friends on Facebook to begin with. Are they forming friends based on similar age or similar gender, similarity in, in TV or, or movie viewing experiences, etc.? This is important. And there have been serious public policy debates all over the world based on this fundamental conflict. So is smoking contagious? How many of you here think that smoking as a behavior is actually contagious? Sure, fan. And all right. And how many of you think that it's not contagious, it's individual choice? So it's evenly split, all right? So you see why this is a serious public policy debate. Um, how about adolescents? Maybe this is contagious for a certain age group, but not contagious after a particular age. In a different setting, you think about e-learning or, or education. Does encouraging group-based learning improve learning outcomes? When you're learning with your friend, do you learn better? How must the groups be formed? There's actually a very interesting paper where they did an experiment on group formation, where they tried to form groups randomly versus pairing the smartest kid with the not so smart kids. So in every group, you had a really smart and a not so smart kid. And they tried to see if that was a better configuration of group formation. I won't tell you what the result was. You can, you can go and, and, and check it out. But any guesses? Which group do you think performed better? The first one? Second one? How many of you say the first one? The random groups learn better. All right. And how many of you think the, the second one performs better? All right. If you go and check out the, the study, you'd be in for a surprise. Right. OK, so let me give you a real world example from uh, a study that actually did solve this problem to a, to a large degree fairly well. And this is from Facebook. These are researchers at Facebook. And they were testing their social advertising uh, feature. This was back in the day when social advertising was a new thing. And the idea of social advertising, for those of you who are not familiar, is you get shown ads on Facebook which have social cues. So they tell you that uh, so-and-so has also liked this particular page. 
So this is a social cue. And they try to see if showing you a social cue increases your click-through rate for a particular ad. So these were the two ads that were shown to different groups of people. For the ad on the left, it's, you can see that, that like 350,000 odd people like this, but it's a generic ad. They don't tell you if there is a friend who's like that page or not. For the ad on the right, they tell you the name of a specific friend from your friend network. This is a social cue. And so the number, the, the, the variable D essentially tells you the number of social cues that are shown to you with the ad. And they wanted to see in which category uh, the number of clicks or the number of likes for the page is higher. So they also wanted to see if there is a marginal peer effect. So from so not just zero and one, but does it also increase from one to two to three? So you see for the first one, they only show you one friend. In the second one, they show you two friends. The third one, they show you three of, three of your friends in the ad. All right? So here are some results. So if you see the, 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 the variable Z on the top, that tells you the number of friends in your friend network who have liked that page. So if Z is one, it means just one of your friends have liked that page. For two and three, it means two and three of your friends have liked that particular page. Now you see, in these three conditions, D is zero, which means no social cue was shown. But even then, you see an increase in like rate for, the three, for, for z equal to 2 and z equal to 3, which means that even if no social cue is shown, if there are more people in your network who have liked that page, there's a higher probability that you will like the page as well. And this, is, this forms the basis of targeting. So this is how you target ads. And this sort of shows that there is homophily, right? So if you, if you have more friends in your network who like a certain thing, there's a higher chance. Since you're friends with those people, there's a higher chance that you like those things as well. But then, they also showed that there's influence. So for each of these groups, when you actually showed one social cue, you got a further lift in the page like rate. Which means that after controlling for the number of people in your friend list who have liked that page, showing a social cue always helps for each group. All right. So this was fantastic because in one study, they showed there is homophily and also influence and they could quantify it. Then they took it further by increasing D from zero to one and then to two and three and showed that it further increased. So now this, this is conclusive evidence that peer influence works in social advertising. All right. So this was from Facebook. Um, but there are some problems in doing uh, this, these kind of studies. The first problem that comes up is in sampling individuals during randomization. Now the first uh, the example that I just showed you was easier because you're just showing a social cue. But you could think about other kinds of A-B testing applications in your areas where if you have a network of people, how do you choose which nodes to treat, which nodes to put in the treatment group, and which nodes to put in the control group? And why might this be a problem? So think about Skype wanting to roll out a new feature. Um, or, or actually, in this case, think about Facebook launching a video chat feature. Now, it randomly assigns the feature to a certain set of nodes. Now what happens if none of the friends of the node that was treated was, are also in the treatment group? So if I don't have any friends who have also been treated with the feature, who do I chat with? Right? So this is a problem. So you can't just blindly randomize nodes in a network for an A-B test. The other problem is about network interference. And this actually happened at my workplace uh, a couple of months back. Uh, so we have a nice sprawling space where uh, we have our individual cubicles, as do most of you, I presume. And we were working. And, and interestingly, we get our internet from three different access points. 
And we generally connect to one or the other randomly depending on our mood on that day. All right? There's no particular reason why anyone connects to a particular access point. And on that particular day, what happened was one of the access points went down. So it randomly cut off internet access for a random sample of people. So you would assume that the people whose internet got snapped, they would have no, nothing to do. So they could just stand up and roam around. Because nowadays, what can you do without internet? And for the rest of us who had internet, would be focusing on our work as usual, right? But after a while, when I stood up and looked around, I saw everyone was roaming around. So what happened? Well, the people who lost their internet access connections will actually stood up and went to chat with their peers who still had internet. And in a, in a matter of time, everyone behaved like they had no internet connection. So this is a good example of what's called network interference, where even though you might not be treated with a particular treatment, just because your friends were treated, it spills over to you. And this is a problem in networks. Uh, and finally, the other big problem is how do you preserve network structure? So if you have a treatment group and a control group in a social network, how do you make sure that the structures, the underlying structures, are similar? And this becomes a problem, especially when you have structural parameters in your model. All right, again, back to Facebook. So if Facebook had to introduce a video chat feature, and just to assume this is the Facebook network, the actual network is slightly bigger than this. Uh, slightly bigger, yeah? And so what the way you would do, uh, do this experiment is you would place a coin on every individual on Facebook, you toss it, and depending on whether it's head or tails, you would assign, it, assign the user to a treatment or control group. That's how you randomize, right? So let's say this is, well, this is how you do it. So on, on, the, on the users where you see this nice smiley face are the ones who have the video chat application, and the other users are the ones who don't have that application. Now this creates a problem because there might be some users, especially towards the leaf nodes, who might be surrounded by users who don't have the application. So whom do they talk to? So what's the perfect way of doing this experiment? The perfect way of doing this experiment is if you had a parallel universe in which you had the same network at the same time. So in this universe, you treat everyone in the network. And in the parallel universe, you leave everyone as is. And then over time, you see the change in outcomes for the treated group versus the control group. But till the time parallel universes become a reality, you'd have to make do with something more uh, feasible. right? So what's a, what's, a, what's, what's a possible solution to this problem? Any guesses? You can be, you can be as weird in your answer as you want, because there's, this is an open problem. Two different times. What's that? Do it at two different times. Do, do it at two different times, all right? So that's one way of doing it. But you don't control for any factors that might be time varying, right? If there's some factor that changes over time. But that's a good option. So what he said is you could, I, could, I could do the treatment and control for the same users, but over different periods in time, all right? Not the best way, but this is definitely one possible way. Any, any other crazy ideas? Right. So you could also do some kind of edge randomization to solve this problem. But again, think about it. This is an actual feature, right? So even if you randomize edges, how would you? It, 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 there might be a chance that you might create edges between people who don't really have an edge in in, in real world. So that's, that's a possibility here. But in, in theory, yes, that's, that's one way of doing it. You do it in small groups and clusters, like find similar clusters and try to randomize between the clusters. Cluster. Which are similar. Yeah, so, so the, exactly. So that's how it's done. Uh, so I'll talk about graph randomization. But before I get into that, there's a, there's, a much, there's a really simple way of doing it that most tech companies generally follow. That is the right way of doing it. What, what's that? Sorry? Someone said geolocation? Release by location. Yeah, pretty much. So 
this is the most preferred strategy in industry. It's called the New Zealand option. So if you've noticed, Facebook is particularly notorious for releasing all its applications in New Zealand first and the rest of the world after that. And the reason it does that was actually, I mean, the, the director of engineering said it himself that their users don't have many international friends, so it works well as a, as a very nice and isolated treatment group. And studies after studies have shown that the, the QEs don't really talk much to their international neighbors, uh, maybe to Australians, but, but not beyond that. So they serve as a natural treatment group for the rest of the world. Um, so this is definitely one way, but this, has, this is nice, but then it has the, the, the other limitation that it's still two groups. It's New Zealand versus rest of the world. And again, this is, this is particularly convenient because it's a, it's a good enough sample to have statistical power. So it's, I think, 4.5 million, 5 million uh, users, English speaking. So it's, it fits in perfectly with being a guinea pig uh, for uh, doing experiments. But it's still two groups. So the other possible uh, option that Facebook at least does is, I think, uh, what you mentioned. You do graph randomization. You graph cluster randomization. So what you, what you do in, in graph cluster randomization is you try to partition your network through some way of partitioning into different clusters, and then assign each cluster to a treatment or control group. So one way of doing partitioning is natural partitions, so New Zealand, right? But then you could also think about algorithms. So there are graph cutting algorithms, or graph partitioning algorithms that you can use, like community detection or label propagation. Um, and using these algorithms, you can form clusters. And then you can randomly assign clusters to treatment or control. And then based on that, you can. So this, again, has its own share of problems. So for example, there might be some clusters towards the boundary and some clusters more interior, which might have differences. And there are ways to solve those problems as well. But there, and this seems to be the state of art in doing A-B testing on social networks, doing graph cluster randomization. So for the study that I just mentioned about uh, chat applications, Facebook actually, I think, they did 6,400 clusters for just their English-speaking American sample. So using the algorithm, they were able to generate these clusters and, and do the randomization. So for more details, you can actually look. So the, the, the paper listed here is this guy called uh, Johan Ugander. I think uh, so he's at, I think, Stanford. Um, and so he does a lot of very interesting work on graph cluster randomization. So you should, you should look him up. Yeah. All right, so in case you cannot do ex experiments and you're only left with a huge data set retrospectively, what can you do with it? Um, can you model the counterfactual using structural approaches? And this is sort of slightly similar to the edge randomization idea that you're talking about. Um, if I have data, can I simulate the treatment and control group through some probabilistic models? Again, not ideal, but this definitely is possible. So you could think about propensity scores. And if some of you here are from biostatistics or uh, have some stats background, you would know uh, about this method called propensity score uh, modeling, where essentially you model each individual's probability of being in a treatment versus control group. Uh, this is particularly useful if there is some reason why people might pre-select themselves to certain groups. All right. You could use Bayesian or graphical approaches. This is particularly common among computer science uh, researchers, where you could think of uh, graphical models to uh, jointly estimate uh, different kinds of intervention and their effects. Uh, you could also use variants of random graph models. And this is probably closer to my area of work, where I try to construct random graphs and try to see how they evolve over time following certain kinds of uh, rule-based evolution. But all these methods are highly assumption intensive. I mean, you, they need to follow a lot of steps for these, these algorithms to actually be valid in the real world. 
A nice trade-off between actual experiments and observational data or what's called natural experiments, which as the name suggests is a way in which you let nature or God sort of partition the treatment and control groups and then you opportunistically use the setting to test your theories. So a good example of natural experiments are natural disasters. Uh, so my advisor uh, has a paper looking at the effect of hurricanes on the change in social networks in the US. So as you know, hurricanes strike a particular area, a particular geographical area. So you could treat people in that area to be treatment groups. And you can think of similar people in other areas, neighboring states and neighboring cities to be your control group. So it has a natural way of splitting your users into treatment and control. And then you can observe different changes in behavior between these groups. So other ways of studying natural experiments could be migration. Uh, so the study here by Munshi is about uh, Mexicans migrating to the US for work and how different uh, over time Mexicans in the US versus Mexicans in Mexico form two different groups uh, based on which you can do different kinds of studies. And group assignments. So if you're, if you're studying a particular module and you have groups formed based on different criteria, you have this natural way of you know, uh, studying different group outcomes based on different uh, treatments. All right, so let me give you a quick teaser of some of my ongoing projects. And if you, any of you are interested in any of these, we could definitely talk more offline. Um, this is a, a study from my thesis. Um, this is under, under revision, actually, in, in, in a major journal. And again, the problem I'm trying to solve here is very simple. So here's, here's, here's me on Facebook. I'm trying to I'm post a lot of content. And let's take for the sake of simplicity that I have three other friends on Facebook. All right? Um, yeah, they look like those, those people. No, not exactly them. Uh, and they're all producing a lot of content every day, right? They're all, always in the news. So they're posting a lot of stuff on Facebook and Twitter every single day. So the fundamental question that I'm trying to answer here is when these individuals increase their rate of posting, what happens to my rate? Do I increase my rate of posting? Uh, because maybe I'm encouraged or motivated by the supreme leader, and I want to be like him, so I increase my rate of tweets and Facebook posts as well. Or maybe I decrease it because I'm really sick and tired of reading all these, all these Facebook and social media posts, and I get so exhausted that I say, no, to hell with it, I'm not going to post anymore. So these are competing theories. And so we partner with a major social network site based in the US. So we have a, a big data set over four years. And using some observational experimental methods, we are trying to tease out which theory plays out in the real world. But there are three problems. Social media postings, unlike smoking, is a fast changing behavior. You could be posting a lot on weekends. But in weekdays, you might be just posting once in five days. Right? So it's a very inconsistent behavior, unlike smoking, which is consistent. Uh, link formation is endogenous. So there, ha there might be preferential attachment. So I have to ask myself the question, why am I friends with Donald Trump? Right? Does it signal some kind of underlying similarities that might be at play? And experimentally manipulating peer behavior is very hard. And I, st I spoke about this in, in a few slides back. So I can't force Donald Trump to increase or decrease his tweets so that I can study the effect on others. So I have to rely on retrospective data to study such kind of problems. All right, so this is just one example of a project that I'm working on. Something more business friendly. So we're looking at trying to predict uh, credit worthiness in emerging communities particularly with microfinance initiatives. So as you would know, financial exclusion is a big problem in developing countries. So there are millions of people with no access to bank accounts. And because of that, they have no, um, they cannot get loans. They cannot get credit from these banking institutions. However, these countries have very high smartphone penetration, some of these countries, more than 80%, pretty high. So this gives us a very interesting opportunity. How can we 
leverage mobility and network data to empower these institutions. Right? That, that's sort of the driving motivation for some of my recent work. So we collaborate with a Southeast Asian-based mobile microfinance company who have been kind enough to uh, share their data with us. And so what we're trying to do, this is our insight from the study, is that we're trying to hypothesize that maybe people who default on their loans might have a, very, might have a different mobility pattern before and after they draw the loans as compared to people who pay their loans on time. And we actually do find that. We find that people who, who, are, who default on their loans, so this is just an illustration. This is not the actual results. But this, this is similar to what we find. We find that once we factor in the locations that these people visit before and after they draw the loans into our predictive model, we get a huge lift in accuracy in predicting their default behavior, which is very interesting and intuitive at the same time, because you would assume that people who draw really big loans might end up spending it in, on, in, in vices, right? They might go gambling. They might go to you know, fancy restaurants. And this gets captured in the mobility behavior. So this is one interesting uh, use case of networks data that we're looking at. So the network angle in this project is that the clustering in different locations might also be attributed to network. So you might be going to a restaurant not because you, want, you like that restaurant, but because your friend dragged you there. So we somehow factor in the network among the, among the loan applicants to sort of see how mobility and networks play together to help us better predict outcomes. All right, this is some more recent work that, that I'm working on and in, in trying to understand if loan default behavior is contagious, like a disorder. So this is the question that we are asking. Is there a network effect in loan default behavior? Simply put, it means, is my loan payment behavior influenced by the payment behavior of my immediate peers? So if all my best friends are paying their loans on time, does that somehow influence me to pay my loans on time or, or default? If yes, then does that also depend on my credit risk? So what this means is, are individuals with higher ability to pay, so these are credit risks, so when the bank thinks that you are a high risk person versus you're a low risk person, are high risk pers pe persons more susceptible to peer influence than low risk individuals, right? So this is from, this is from the actual paper. So this is ongoing work. So this is just a visualization of a low credit risk sample where the, the red circles are people who paid, paid their loans on time. The blue ones are people who defaulted. So you see, this, is, this probably makes sense, right? So if you're a low risk individual, uh, there's a high chance that you pay back your loans on time, okay? And this is for a high credit risk sample. So you see a lot more uh, blue dots. So these, this, the, a lot of people in this sample actually defaulted on their loans. Now for both of these subsamples, we are interested to see if there is evidence of contagion in the payment behavior. And this is what we found. So for the first sample, for the low credit risk sample, we find that most of the users are clustered near zero. So there's actually very limited evidence of contagion. But very interestingly, for the high credit risk sample, we see these two peaks on both sides. So we see evidence of influence, but for both positive influence as well as negative influence, which means that high risk individuals are susceptible both to positive uh, payment as well as default. So, if, if, so what this means is that high risk individuals basically react more strongly to both good peers and bad peers, which again is very interesting for microfinance institutions to learn Finally, and I'd probably leave you with this slide, um, uh, one future direction for social network research is in understanding if we can go from peers to structures and topologies. So do network structures matter? So, so far I've been able to sort of argue the point that your, you, what you do matters and what your friends do matter. But 
What about the relationship, the interrelationships among your friends? Is that important? So you have, so you have uh, two networks having the same set of nodes, but a very different network structure. So the second network has uh, a larger number of cycles, right? Higher clustering. So does a higher, highly clustered network influence your outcome more than a, a, a lower clustered network? And in which kinds of outcomes is this uh, a case? And again, what about incompletely observed networks? And I think if any of you work on social network data from real world platforms, you're very familiar with incomplete network. So you'd probably know uh, details about some users, but you'd be completely unaware about some other users who are connected to your focal user. And how do you deal with networks that have a lot of incomplete data? So this is again a very active area of research. So, so my one line summary for the whole presentation, kind of like a takeaway line, is what can we do with incompletely observed and egocentric networks? So you only know network for a certain sample of users and not for everyone. Incomplete, egocentric network, how can we leverage this kind of data for predictive as well as uh, explanatory applications? All right, so uh, this is what, really what I had for you. I'm really interested to talk more offline, especially if you were working on network context in urban systems. So you could be thinking about network resilience of MRT networks, power grids, adoption or diffusion of different kinds of shared economy applications. Um, you could be working in FinTech, uh, very similar to what I just explained. You could be thinking about network credit scoring and network analytic applications in credit scoring. <laughs> about how do you profile applicants, uh, loan applicants, based on their social network data. You could be working on healthcare and understanding how healthy behavior is diffused through a network. So you'd see fitness applications. Uh, how do fitness applications gain peer influence in networks? Uh, you could also try to think about how health communities online evolve as a result of uh, these interactions among, among its actors. And finally, you could be thinking about e-commerce businesses and trying to understand how your friends uh, might be influencing what you buy online, right? You'd see e-commerce sites have social cues as well. They try to tell you what your friends are buying uh, in the hope that you would make, this, make similar purchases or not. So these are some applications that I could think of and if you're interested or working on any of these applications and want to know more about uh, want to talk more about what you know about networks and what we could work together uh, very excited to talk to you thank you very much you've been a great audience um, and reach out to me if you have any clarifications comments or just if you just want to chat all right thank you very much any any weird out of the box questions Go on. <coughs> I actually get this question a lot from my friends in sociology. And, and they always tell me, when I tell them that I study social networks, they always tell me that you don't study real networks. These are not real people. Uh, real networks are people you meet offline. And I always tell them that, well, yes and no. I mean, if there is a person who spends 16 hours on Facebook every day, how do you say that's not real and the person you meet offline is the real version? Right? So uh, there's no is right, right or wrong answer to what you just asked. It, it depends on what's the question you're trying to answer. Uh, if you're trying to answer a question that demands data from offline networks and the data you have is from Facebook, then you're going to end up with very wrong conclusions and vice versa. If you're trying to predict behavior on Facebook and you ask people offline, uh, you're going to end up with very inaccurate results, right? Like for example, you could ask individuals, um, and this was an actual study done. Uh, thanks for asking that question. So there was, the, again, from Facebook, uh, researchers asked people, uh, how many friends do you have in your Facebook network? And they came up with a heuristic, some, some number which they thought was correct. 
And then they ask them, how many of these friends do you think read your last status update, the last update that you posted? How many of your friends do you think read it? Um, and then they went back and they verified their answers with actual Facebook logs, server logs, to try to see if the users underestimated or overestimated the number. What's your guess? Do you think users underestimated the number of friends who read their posts or overestimated? How many of you say underestimated? And how many of you say overestimated? Right, so majority of you feel that the users tend to think that everyone's reading their post. Uh, actually, no. So the study found that the individual systematically underestimated the number of people they thought read their last post uh, because they have no idea. So there's, this, there's a lot of studies in social psychology that talk about this um, spotlight effect. So people generally think that uh, you always think that everyone's looking at you. But in this particular study, they showed that on Facebook, a very different kind of social psychology plays. So it's the opposite of spotlight effect. Even though you, I mean, you think that fewer people are looking at you than the actual case. So in the real world and in the virtual world, even social psychology theories can, can be completely flipped. So that's, again, depends on what, what you're really looking at. Yeah. Yes. Why am I what? Why am I not? Why do I not work for Twitter? No. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. I haven't, but there have been researchers who have studied uh, systematic differences in Facebook, Twitter, MySpace which was there before Facebook. Um, and there was one other Japanese social network site. Um, what was the name? Uh, yeah, but there has been studies that have looked at cultural and also behavioral differences in how people behave on these platforms. Um, so if you, if you look, I mean, you, you can go and search on, on the internet, you'd find many such papers that look at, uh, but this is particularly, this is mainly done on student samples with adolescents. Uh, I have I'm, I haven't seen a lot of studies done on mature populations. Yeah. Uh, what kind of tools would you recommend to study social network? And is there any tool that allows you to study network as we have also the time? Yes. Right. So uh, my preferred social network uh, library and package would be iGraph, because I generally deal with larger networks. Uh, but if you're looking at smaller networks, you could use NetworkX in Python. You could use uh, SNA in R. Uh, if you're looking at visualization, you could again, I mean, I generally don't like the visualization tools in R or Python. So I sometimes use this tool, open source tool called Gephi. Uh, so there's a tool called Gephi. It's an open source. You can download it. And it's inter, inter, you can integrate it with Python RR. So you can just dump, you can dump your network as a graph ML or as an edge list or an adiosensi matrix, and you can import it back into, the, into Gephi. Um, but in terms of analysis for dynamic networks over time, I think iGraph, as well as there are some packages for dynamic networks in R that I generally use for my research, um, plus visualization. So if you're using D3JS or any kind of JS-based uh, visualization, you could use Python or R, because they have libraries to integrate that with JS. But if you want something more sort of click and point, you could use Gephi. That's for the visualization part. That's sort of my pipeline. Yeah. Yes.
Sure. And there's still another component where, let's say, if somebody has uh, victims enough to set the belief from you, then you kind of cut off that uh, relationship. Correct. So the, the age kind of disappears. Correct. And In terms of their um, natural characteristics, yes. Um, I mean, a, a very simple answer would be that they they have high degree centrality. Um, so, if you have important personalities, they would have many um, followers or many friends. But in terms of okay, the the other big problem in networks is this idea of bounded rationality. So, you might have a sense of how many friends you have but you don't have a good sense of how they are connected, right? You might have a heuristic. I mean, you might know that your best friends are connected to each other, but beyond that, you have no idea. Um, so it's hard to say. I don't, I don't know if, so there have been uh, studies looking at networks of politicians and trying to see if there's any structural difference. But again, these networks are egocentric networks. So it's incomplete data. So, uh, a company like Facebook can probably do a more detailed study because they have all the network. But so the one interesting difference that I, that, that I think of right now is this famous uh, small world study that Facebook does from time to time. So the small world study uh, starts with, so you, you, you can get your own small world number. The idea of small world is starting from you, how, how soon in how many hops can you reach every other person on Facebook in the Facebook universe? And they try to show that really important people have very small, small world numbers. So a person like Mark Zuckerberg has, like, I think, slightly less than three at this point. Um, the, the original study by Stanley Milgram uh, had actually uh, shown six, or five point something to be the number. What's that? Yeah, five. five points. Some, and that has been, I mean, Facebook has been doing this study every year. And it's been going down each year. And they use this as a nice PR to show that you know, Facebook makes the world a smaller place. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's one uh, structural difference as well. It's some, sort of related to closeness. Um, but again, this is a study that only Facebook can do. Yeah. Um, how would one go about getting data if uh, one is interested in doing one of the study? Because like, you mentioned the credit uh, rating part. I had a similar idea a couple of years back, but I struggled to even figure out how an entrepreneur or a smaller firm can go about getting some relevant data to do some social network analysis and right. influence on some behavior. So off the top of, based on my limited experience, I can tell you that if you want to do a really good job with any kind of social network research problem, you need a a very good data set. And in my limited experience, I'd say that data set would probably come from a collaborator. So you would have to do a joint project with an industry partner who has access to the data. Back in the day, they used to do network studies with surveys, do, they, to administer survey questions to yeah. individuals and ask questions like, can you tell me six of your closest friends? Uh, so that, that, that worked well for, for some time, but then it's not feasible anymore, yeah. So you need a collaborator who's willing to work with you on such problems, yeah. All right, then do you have any, any other questions? Yeah, or we could talk offline. Um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd stick around for a while. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much.